The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and Flight Bridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey, everybody. This is Eric back with you. We are so happy that you're joining us for another episode of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast. I uh, apologize. It's been about two weeks since we released our last uh, episode. I've uh, been very, very busy traveling and uh, excited to kind of have a, a little bit more time to spend with you and uh, put out some good content. Uh, one of the things, if you are a listener to uh, our Second Shift podcast, uh, you probably heard the last episode. I believe it was episode 16, and Mike Verkest and I had a discussion regarding lactate. Uh, this has been a topic that I've been wanting to address for some time. Um, obviously, this is a very hot topic in the critical care uh, environment around the world. And if you follow uh, me on Twitter at Flatbridge Ed or other people in the FOMED industry, you probably have seen many, many conversations regarding lactate uh, and the SMAC sepsis panel where they discussed lactate in depth. Um, That was a really, really good talk. They had, I think, five or six, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, leading intensivists from around the world, um, all over the world, and each person kind of talked about their view of lactate and the the role in lactate in critical care medicine, uh, more specifically in sepsis. And so based on that, um, I believe MCRIT put out a a podcast that basically um, highlighted that talk and, and put out a video of that talk, so I, I encourage you to go check that out. But based on that, you know, we have talked a lot about lactate, and I talk a lot about lactate in our review classes, and, you know, it's always been a big passion of mine, understanding oxygenation physiology. I think that's something that we really, really need to focus on, and I, I say often uh, in any of my talks that really when we think about oxygenation and how that's going to affect our patient, we really need to start at the at the uh, understanding of the cellular level and start doing BLS procedures at a really high level. You know, it's not all about the advanced procedures that we can apply. It's, it's about doing the little things, uh, with the utmost, uh, perfection, uh, and then building on each one of those things. So I think it's important to understand the role of lactate, um, the misconceptions of lactate, uh, and misconceptions, based on, you know, the the past uh, and the past kind of theories that have been out there. Um, I myself have often, uh, I shouldn't say often, but I I find myself always referring back to those initial uh, educational topics um, or or, um, lectures that I heard regarding lactate and, and that lactate was a big indicator of tissue hypoxia. And I think that's where the misconception lies is that It was always thought that, all right, we're going to draw lactate, and lactate being high was a a complete reflection of tissue hypoxia. And we have to understand that that it's been proven uh, based on uh, quite a few uh, research articles and and studies from around the world that that's absolutely not true. So I think it's fitting that I do a quick talk on lactate, lactate's role in our uh, care, uh, and try to apply it to the pre-hospital environment. As I said, we did a, a, a second shift podcast, Mike Verkest and I, and we, we, we you know, briefly talked about lactate. And, you know, he brought up uh, that his agency, you know, he uh, just took a new position with uh, a fire department as their training officer. And he was alluding to that they actually have lactate monitors and those lactate monitors have been in place now a few weeks. And I applaud any agency that's trying to, um, you know, outfit their, their paramedics and their uh, EMS providers with better equipment so they can make better decisions. But I also um, am a realist. I think the the longer I do this job and and involved in medicine, I realize that uh, you you still have to make good clinical decisions. And we can give our providers all the great equipment, all this new stuff. 
you know, is that going to really make a difference patient care wise? And as many of you know, Mike Rakist is, is one of my closest friends. I love him dearly. And, and, you know, but sometimes I guess we have to agree to disagree. And I think for me, uh, based on the new science, the new literature, I don't know if there's a role for actual lactate monitoring in the field for EMS providers. And I'm going to try to lay out my argument based on this. Uh, I've taken quite a bit of time to research this so I can try to uh, speak at a level that that obviously supports my my thought process, and um, you leave it out for you guys. I'm going to cite a study. I'm going to put the study on the website um, so you guys can actually refer to it, and I encourage you to read it and kind of decide for yourself. So the study that we're going to kind of refer to is uh, from the Journal of Intensive Care. It's called A Lactate Kinetics in Sepsis and Septic Shock: A Review of the Literature and Rationale for Further Research. So based on that, I'm going to start off with, you know, kind of a, a, a look at a part of that uh, lecture. This, um, this review um, starts off with a really profound statement based on, you know, just kind of my opinion. It says, traditionally, lactic acidosis and sepsis is attributed to anaerobic glycolysis due to inadequate oxygen delivery. However, it's been clear that met- Mechanisms of hyperlactemia and sepsis is multifactorial and due to the factors beyond hypoxic tissue injury alone. For example, James E.T. All proposed that lactic acidosis refractory to standard resuscitation is frequently due to increased aerobic glycolysis in skeletal muscles secondary to epinephrine-stimulated sodium and potassium pumps. And it is not a result of anaerobic glycolysis from hypoperfusion. Furthermore, Guterres et al. emphasized that the etiology of prolonged lactic acidosis and sepsis is often multifactorial, making it unreliable as a marker of oxygen debt and inadequate resuscitation. So when I read that, you know, that was kind of a big slap in the face. It goes against every single thing that I initially was taught. Um, obviously, I was at SMAC. I, I heard the lecture. I heard the, the panel and what they had to say. And, you know, I had, I had slowly already started changing my opinion. Obviously, we really rely on these uh, researchers, these uh, intensivists, these doctors from around the world to do these great studies and take the time to look at this stuff so we can change our approach to medicine. So let's really quickly go through kind of the concepts of glycolysis and, and try to relate this and explain why the thought process about lactate has changed. As I said, this is something that I hit on in all of our review classes. And if you've taken our review classes, you kind of know that that I look at this from a, a pretty important perspective and we start off our, our day uh, with this talk. So we have to remember that we need to look at this from a, an objective standpoint. So I want to focus on some key points, and I'm going to lay out those key points, and then we're going to dive into the pathophysiology. So the first key point we're going to look at is blood lactate concentrations reflect the balance between lactate production and clearance. So that's going to be a very, very important part of kind of tying this all together. The second key point is glycolysis and a term called gluconeogenesis, which is essentially the conversion of carbohydrates, proteins, lipids to glycogen for the use in glycolysis. And pyruvate conversion to and from lactate are linked with levels of what's called NADH. And when we talk about this, I'll explain what the NADHs are for, but essentially they are the prime ingredient that we use in the electron transport chain to convert um, to ATP for cellular function. The third key point is failure of any oxidative mechanism. So basically a chemical reaction can affect both production and clearance of lactate. Fourth, lactate concentrations greater than five millimoles per liter with severe metabolic acidosis predicts high mortality after 24 hours. So the 24 hour mark is what we're going to kind of focus on based on this literature. Impaired lactate clearance rather than hypoxic tissue production of lactate is the cause of hyperlactemia in stable septic patients. So again, it's all about lactate clearance. It's not based on hypoxic tissue status of of any kind. 
contrary to what's previously been taught or the assumptions by the medical community, lactate is a glycolysis byproduct that can be produced and utilized continuously by various body cells at rest and even under conditions of adequately oxygenated states. And number seven, we have to understand that lactate is a big, big deal. It's a primary fuel, and just the process of shuttling this through the bloodstream works as an important carbon source for all those chemical reactions that we need in our body, especially for that um, gluconeogenesis that we see in the liver that, that converts other uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids to glycogen when we need it. So based on that, I want to I wanna start off and, and, and kind of build on a few concepts. Let's think of how our body actually metabolizes and utilizes sugar. The first state is what's called a fed state. That fed state is essentially a state where we're actively eating food, um, we're eating food often, and our body is going to utilize sugars uh, from the breakdown of our food. Uh, it'll use that as we need it for energy, and then anything excess, it's going to actually convert to glycogen, and it's going to be stored in our liver. In contrast, we have a fasting state, and I alluded to this before, and a fasting state would be a great example of us going to bed at night, let's say 9 o'clock, we get up in the morning at 6 o'clock, so that time period that we're sleeping, our body needs energy, and it's going to pull from our liver, it's going to pull from our reserves. That process um, is called gluconeogenesis. So during that process, um, we have to remember that glycogen is what's called a polymer. And a polymer is essentially um, a chain of, of molecules. So glycogen is a chain of glucose molecules. And based on gluconeogenesis, the breakdown of that glycogen to sugar, then we utilize that glucose molecule in the glycolysis phase, in aerobic metabolism, in anaerobic metabolism, in, in all these different processes that we need that sugar molecule. We have to also remember that our brain constantly needs uh, glucose, uh, especially during that fasting state. It really metabolizes a lot of our glycogen stores for fuel during that state where we're not actually actively eating. So we have to understand that this fed state and this fasting state, we use and break down glycogen to uh, utilize as energy during that glycolysis phase. So all this is going to kind of make more sense when we start talking about how we actually make ATP. And we know that ATP production is the essential ingredient for cellular function. We have to have ATP. So let's look at the glycolysis phase. The glycolysis phase is essentially a breakdown of glycogen. That glycogen is actually stimulated based on beta-2 stimulation. So a beta-2 receptor stimulates the liver. The liver is our storage center for glycogen. It stimulates, releases glycogen. Remember, glycogen is a polymer. It's, it's a chain of glucose molecules. And then we utilize those glucose molecules during this glycolysis phase. So we have this glycolysis phase and that sugar molecule now, that glucose molecule, we have to remember is a six carbon molecule. And carbon is one of those things that almost every uh, thing on this in this world actually is made up of carbon. And carbon is a huge, huge energy source. So we have a splitting of that glucose molecule. And that glucose molecule, like I said, is a six carbon molecule. It splits into what's called pyruvate. Those pyruvate now share three each of the six carbon molecules that were attached to that glucose molecule. So we started with a glucose molecule, we converted to two pyruvate molecules. So at this point, this is where it's kind of important to understand the role of lactate. Lactate is one of those things that our body needs in all sorts of different processes. Our heart needs it, our skeletal muscles need it, we need it for a, uh, a, a big energy source. So under aerobic conditions, Pyruvate, right, the splitting of glucose into pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA. A acetyl a is uh, essentially a, a molecule that's used in metabolism. Um, it, it conveys that carbon 
atom that we talked about that is uh, starts with a six carbon off of the glucose, splits into the two pyruvate. Now we have six carbons on each pyruvate. Well, that acetylcholine um, helps carry those carbons into the Krebs cycle for a, a, a fuel source for further chemical reactions or what's called oxidative energy. So based on that, we move into the Krebs cycle. If we compare that to an anaerobic condition, pyruvate is actually converted to lactate. And lactate is then converted to lactic acid. But we also have to understand that lactate, as I said, is a, is a very, very important fuel source. So during glycolysis, because of the splitting of the glucose molecule to pyruvate, that pyruvate can actually convert to lactate in the glycolysis phase. So whether we're in an aerobic state or an anaerobic state, pyruvate is the prime source for producing lactate. And our body is going to produce lactate when it needs to. In situations where our body's stressed and things like that, obviously we're going to have a hyper stimulation of glycolysis. And that's what we kind of need to understand is that that hyper stimulation, that glycolysis that happens over and over and over because of a stress response. Well, let's, let's think about what happens with a stress response. Any of us that has a stress response has a sympathetic response. And we have a surge in beta-1 and beta-2 stimulation. Our respiratory rate increases. Our heart rate increases. Our, um, our lungs kind of dilate out so we can take in more air. Our pupils dilate. Well, that process um, releases, like I said, more beta-1, beta-2 stimulation. Well, that process is going to secrete and stimulate glycogen release from the liver and that glycolysis is going to happen much much more rapidly so it's really really important to understand that lactate is produced in both processes aerobic and anaerobic processes and that we have to look at lactate from the perspective of is this lactate produced because of a stress response and if that is the cause based on the research how can we utilize lactate now uh, and look at lactate in a different way and understand that it's not because of hypoperfusion. Obviously, when we look at sepsis, we're always trying to fix the, the, the what's called microcirculation or um, you know a reduction in microcirculation, which is essentially your cardiac output, your MAP blood pressure, um, you know oxygenation status. And a lot of times, you know that is corrected based on either augmenting that with medications, innovating the patient and putting them on the ventilator, um, starting levofed, starting secondary pressors like vasopressin, uh, and perfusing uh, based on improvement in cardiac output with help from those uh, additional medications. The whole goal of looking at lactate, though, is, is, is really, really important when you look at it from the perspective of trending. And so this is kind of where I have an issue with utilizing this in the pre-hospital environment on an initial call. We have to remember that the basis of our treatment is always first to identify a surge response. I mean, let's be honest, we're, we're mainly talking about sepsis and uh, septic shock. Obviously, you can have increased lactate levels uh, for other reasons and other disease processes, other illnesses, but really the focus is on sepsis and limiting the amount of patients that move from that surge response to that sepsis to that septic shock. So really quickly, a systemic response or a surge response, you have to have two or more of the following. You have to have either a temperature that's, that's greater than 38 degrees Celsius. You have to have a heart rate greater than 90 um, you have to have a respiratory rate greater than 20 or a CO2 less than 32, or you have to have, have a white blood cell count greater than 12,000 um, or 10% band. So you have to have two of those things before it's classified as a surge response. So if I kind of look at this from the perspective of how does this apply to the pre-hospital environment and early lactate monitoring, lactate uh, can be elevated for many, many reasons. You could have a patient that maybe ran a marathon the day before. Maybe they went and worked out. Maybe they're dehydrated. Uh, maybe they, um, 
um, have been uh, laying around, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that will cause a surge in lactate. So based on that, I really, really feel like utilizing a lactate monitor uh, for the purpose of identifying potential sepsis is kind of the wrong approach. When you look at this, you know, can we identify a temperature accurately? Well, yeah. Um, is that something that's probably done uh, as much or as often as possible on scene um, as an EMS provider? Probably not. Obviously, we can look at a heart rate. We can look at the respiratory rate. Um, we can't ever identify white blood cell count. So I look at this and I'm like, okay, well, how is this going to change the care? If the patient is decompensating enough to warrant um, a look, to warrant suspicion of a surge response, then they probably should be taking to uh, a hospital that is going to have the care in ICU uh, to handle that type of patient. So is it going to change anything to check a lactate in the field? I would probably argue no. Does it give you maybe a added tool to uh, evaluate is this patient having some type of a, a, a an issue? Well, yeah, possibly. But again, I kind of look at it like, is that going to change my care? I kind of relate this to how we evaluate posterior wall MIs in the field and how cardiologists, and I've had many cardiologists tell me this and agree, that a posterior MI is maybe uh, isolated 3% of the time. So 97% of the time, a posterior wall MI is always going to be associated with an inferior wall MI. So do I need to be doing a posterior 12 lead? And the answer is no. It doesn't give me any added information. And the, 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 the percentage of finding an isolated posterior 12 lead is so minute that I don't think it warrants doing them in the field. Now, can I, can I see them doing it in a hospital setting? Yeah, possibly. But talking to cardiologists, they, they tend to not do that. So I kind of look at this lactate monitor kind of similar. Um, and again, I'm not going against um, kind of the mainstream. And, and I know that, you know, we want new cool tools out there. And I think lactate monitoring is going to be a useful tool, but I think it needs to be uh, utilized in the right way. So I'm going to read another section of the study, and then I'll expand on that based on kind of my thoughts. So this section is lactate as a late prognosticator in sepsis management. Literature evaluating the clinical and predictive value of lactate measurements beyond the initial six-hour resuscitation period in the medical management of sepsis is significantly less robust. In study of 137 surgical intensive care unit patients, Hussein ETL showed elevated initial and 24-hour lactate levels to be significant predictors of mortality and mortality ranging from 10 to 67%, depending on whether lactate levels normalized or failed to normalize at the 24-hour mark. In other studies investigating ICU patients, Baker ETL showed that lactate clearance measured 24 hours after admission with significant predictors of in-hospital mortality and that the duration of persistent lactic acidosis was more predictive of mortality than the initial lactate value. Similarly, Friedman showed in a 35-patient study that survivors of sepsis and severe sepsis admitted to the medical intensive care unit had significantly lower lactate values at 24 hours of resuscitation than non-survivors. Finally, Mankus ETL followed lactate measurements every eight hours for 72 hours in 125, uh, correction, 129 trauma patients and demonstrated serial lactate measurements and the duration of hyperlactemia to be reliable indicators of morbidity and mortality. Marty ETL measured lactates at 0, 6 hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours and showed the best predictor of death was at the 24-hour clearance mark. These authors concluded that during the first 24 hours in the ICU, hyperlactemia, even after the golden hours, is associated with increased mortality. And lactate clearance directed therapy should be considered for the first 24 hours of treatment. Similarly, in an 81-patient study, they investigated 6-hour, 12-hour, and 24-hour lactate clearance in patients with sepsis and septic shock and found only the 24-hour lactate clearance measurements to be associated with mortality. So I think that that kind of says a lot to me. Um, you know, does that mean that 
we're going to be utilizing lactates in the field and that's going to change their care. I just don't really know if it will. Um, I look at lactate monitors as an extra tool, but I challenge these agencies and I say, if you're going to use lactate monitoring, um, let's look at the entire sepsis treatment paradigm. Do you still have dopamine on your ambulances? Are you, do you have Levofit on your ambulances? Um, do you have protocols to um, optimize preload and limit volume? Do you have an understanding of simple procedures like l lifting the legs and, and seeing if you have an increase in blood pressure just by doing that? Do you have an understanding of the difference between uh, you know, normal saline and LR? You know, I, I can't tell you how many places we travel to and teach where they don't carry LR whatsoever. And, and I see so many issues with giving a, a, a volume um, like normal saline. I don't think one, two liters is going to cause a, an issue. But I think it's, it's important to understand the differences and understand the role that normal saline has on an overall inflammatory response. The huge increase in chloride and how that can lead to um, a hyperchloremic uh, metabolic acidosis. So I think the education needs to be more focused on the new science, the new science of, you know, improving that preload early with Levofed and, and going smaller on your volume. Um, and lactate needs to be done at the hospital level. And it really, really matters looking at lactate clearance and getting that lactate down and seeing that drop into normal levels. So I'm going to expand a little bit again. If the rate of glycolysis rises to a point where um, the whole system is overwhelmed, concentrations of what's called NADH, as I said, was the primary fuel source that's put into what's called an ATP synthesis pump, that is converted to ATP. So the whole level of NADH is, is a prime uh, a trigger point for lactate production. So if those NADHs are made over and over and over based on glycolysis happening, happening over and over and over, then lactate production is actually going to skyrocket. Because this process happens so much, glycolysis is then kind of fueled by pyruvate converting to lactate. So it's kind of, it's kind of counterproductive. We know that glycolysis turns to pyruvate and pyruvate converts to acetylcholine, and we know that um, it also converts uh, and forms CO2. But when you have this hyper stimulation of glycolysis, it has to uh, produce more energy. And that energy is made from pyruvate converting to lactate, and that just builds more lactate. If we kind of expand on this a little further and we look at how ATP is so important for cellular function, we need to produce 36 ATP in aerobic metabolism, and we know in anaerobic metabolism we only produce 2 ATP. So if you looked at this from that perspective of anaerobic metabolism, and ATP obviously going from 36 in aerobic metabolism and down to 32 in anaerobic metabolism, we know that the result of this often is from a, a hypoxic state, so hypoxemia, right, a shock state. We know it can be from a hypemic hypoxia. We know that hemoglobin concentrations alone are a huge, huge prognosticator for overall oxygenation delivery. And all that leads to hyperperfusion, right? If we don't have cardiac output, we don't have the proper ability to move oxygen-rich blood, then we're going to be in big trouble. If you think about this in context of somebody that's, that's really exercising, exerting themselves, or a patient that um, has carbon monoxide poisoning. All those things cause a huge rise in, in lactate as well. And then you think about, well, what causes all this stimulation? And I kind of alluded to this before. And that stimulation is done by either what's called endogenous secretion of neurotransmitters, like epi, norepi, or our administration of those catecholamine medications, um, all those stimulate glycolysis. If that stimulation is high enough, we're going to have a, a, a huge increase in lactate production. When we expand on this a little further, 
when we think about severe exercise, our myocytes are a big, big generation source for lactate and lactate um, buildup. The big reason why is, is, is not so much for our muscles. I mean, obviously our muscles are going to be a, a big um, uh, source of burning through that lactate, but it's for our heart. Our heart needs that extra energy uh, to kind of keep up with the exertion. So fo- following severe exercise and during a gentle warm down, um, our, our muscle fibers account for an increased proportion of lactate metabolism. We burn through a lot of metabolism, or we sh- I should say, we burn through a lot of lactate during that time. And then we have to think about the whole clearance thing. And again, it comes back to clearance, and it comes back to evaluating lactate clearance, and are we seeing the lactate drop? That's our goal. We're seeing the lactate dr- drop. We have to remember that all of this starts by beta-2 stimulation from our liver. So we have to remember that our liver actually receives a big, big chunk of our cardiac output. You know, I often say this in classes that our heart receives about 25%, our kidneys receive approximately 25%, and our liver uh, receives about 25%. That hepatic portal vein that supplies blood to the liver um, supplies about 75% of the blood to the liver. So... And it also burns through or, or, or transports about 60% of the oxygen supply that our liver actually requires. So if we have any changes to, to our hepatic blood flow of any kind, and we see this a lot in our, our organ dysfunction, in our sepsis patients, um, where our liver is so essential for this process, if we start having a decreased uh, amount of perfusion to that liver, our um, ability to get rid of lactate, because our liver actually helps get rid of lactate along with our uh, kidneys, but we also will have an issue with building lactate as well. So that will cause a buildup of lactate. So very, very important to understand the functionality of our liver and we have to have a perfused liver. So based on that, if your liver has a reduction of 25% of normal, um, you're going to have a big, big reduction in lactate clearance. So again, it all comes back to lactate clearance. And all this means is, is that lactate is not a, an indication of t- tissue hypoxia. It's not an indication of hypoxemia um, of any sort. It's an indication of a stress response, and it's an indication of our body's ability to clear lactate. If the stress response is so large that we're constantly building lactate, that's a big, big indicator of morbidity and mortality and probable death. If our body's able to clear lactate properly, that means that everything is perfused appropriately. We fixed all that, that microcirculation that maybe is hyperperfused from, you know, just that shock state. And again, all those things kind of play in, in, into reducing the perfusion, the inflammatory response, the, uh, the, the breakdown of epithelial tissues, the breakdown of the glycocalyx, the, the, the uh, hair-like projections off of our vessels that break down and cause that capillary leakage, that third spacing of volume. All those things play into, are we adequately perfusing our brain, our heart, our kidneys, our liver? All those things are important. So it takes an overall kind of approach to care to cause our body to appropriately utilize lactate when it needs to and clear lactate and so when we when we kind of look at this and and i kind of tie this all together we have to be really really good at not using a tool like that to say you know what they've got a lactate of four they they must be in trouble let's look at the overall signs and symptoms and let's treat them early so i think the education needs to be focused on identifying a surge response identifying a potential patient that could be in trouble and aggressively treating them and getting them to the most appropriate facility. The lactate is not going to be the goal, guys, in that early, early stage like that. It is a added tool to be looked at kind of as that last ingredient. But your, all your assessment, all your assumptions, all the clinical findings, all those things that you see visually, all those things should be done without that lactate. Because in the end, based on this literature, uh, based on the sepsis panel, Uh, that was done at SMAC. Lactate is a great tool for clearance and identifying a stress response and identifying if the patient's going to do well or not do well. And that is at the 24-hour mark. 
so I hope that this um, this education was 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 good. I think this is something that that I've wanted to do for quite some time. I think we can easily jump on the bandwagon um, and and not look at the overall literature, not look at the overall studies, and just think that an extra tool like this is kind of the the, the say all. And as I said, I think it's a great tool, but I don't know if there's a place in the pre hospital environment. I think if if we had the ability to look at other indicators if everybody carried an ice dap machine and we were able to get a blood gas associated with a lactate and we could identify things like that it may give us a little bit more ability to make decisions but then again again i argue it shouldn't change our clinical um approach to a sepsis patient or a surge response all those things are based on abc's and whether you have a lactate or you don't have a lactate um, shouldn't change that mindset. So that's all I have for this lecture. I will post this study um, in a link on the show notes. For those of you, I have had quite a few emails. When I say a link on the show notes, you actually have to go to the website. So go to flightbridgehead.com, go up to the banner, and click on podcasts. You'll see two podcasts pop down. You'll see the Flight Bridgehead podcast, the Second Shift podcast. You'll actually click on the Flight Bridget podcast, and the newest podcast that's published is going to be at the top. And then you should see that link, and I'll, I'll actually uh, post it uh, as a PDF. And uh, you can check it out and read it. And, uh, you know, I hope that everybody kind of sees this as, you know, a, a an objective overview of lactate and its, its use in our industry. As I've said many, many times, thank you so much for all the, the following, the nice emails, um, all of the class requests that we're getting. Um, is very, very overwhelming, and, and I'm very thankful, as well as my wife. We want to thank um, everybody that, that is part of the Flatbridge Ed team. Um, you know, you guys don't get enough credit, and so I'm going to kind of name you guys and, and uh, really, really want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart and my, my, my wife feels the same way. Uh, the first person is Evan Clouch. Evan Clouch is somebody that is one of my closest friends. Um, he is an asset to Flatbridge Ed that, that I can't uh, put into words. He's been with me since day one and uh, he, is, he does so much behind the scenes he does all of our artwork he does all of our publishing of, of the podcasts all the website building all the it stuff systems administrator stuff um you know he's a, he's just a great overall guy has a great business mind um couldn't have done all this without him obviously I want to thank my wife my wife is um i say all the time in these review classes is somebody that is behind the scenes that makes me look really good and and you know, she doesn't get the credit she deserves, and so I want to thank her and uh, all that she does. She puts up with me and my honoriness and and uh, really does put in a lot of time to uh, building Flight Bridget and, and building this brand. Um, next, I want to thank Bruce Hoffman. Bruce Hoffman is um, a guy that I've come to know based on, um, you know, the, the blogs, Twitter, things like that. He started writing for Flight Bridget and the Flight Bridget blog about four months ago. Um, he's a, an amazing guy, an amazing clinician, and um, I'm really, really proud to have him as part of the team. Um, uh, really, really excited about the future. And then lastly, Clint Klepping, uh, another great, talented guy that has been riding for us for the last three or four months. Again, very, very energetic, very much about FOMED and, and our, our kind of industry and um, you know, pushing our, our, our brand to people around the world. So again, very talented, very excited, very energetic, and, and very, very thankful that he's willing to give up his time to write for us and put out great content. So, you know, for all of us from the Flight Bridget team, I just want to say thank you and, and just keep the emails coming. And, and we really, really appreciate all that you do, all the kind words, and for spreading the word around the world. Um, we know that we're nothing without you, and, and for that, I'm very, very thankful. So until next time, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education. 